It looks like everyone is named in the room. And I just want to ask, before we get too far along, is everyone hearing me okay? And it's not blasting you away, it's not way too loud? No, it's good. It's okay? Okay. Well, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I didn't know if everyone would have the um, ambition to go out in the pouring rain, and I really appreciate it, and I know I know you'll be happy you did. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Tammy Barber. I work at the Spires Riverview Hospital and have for almost 20 years now, and, uh, and I'm part of the marketing communications team. Um, before we get started with our presentation, there's a therapy for that. Um, we are going to uh, introduce uh, the recipient, the representative from our donation agency, or our, the agency we're donating to this evening. Um, it's Stop the School Bus, and if you haven't heard of, of it before, Amy Fruno, who is the coordinator for the United Way, is here to tell you a little bit about it. Um, we've been around nine, maybe ten years now. Um, we're um, a joint effort between United Way, the local school districts, um, and some other nonprofits that are involved. And what we do as a committee is we get together, um, we start planning in January, and we get together maybe once a month and we talk about how we need to get to where we need to be um, with donations and our events. So we have Stuff the Bus, which is our first event um, August 1st which is during lunch by the river. Um, and we do bring a school bus and we put our supplies in it. So we literally stuff the bus with school supplies. So those school supplies that you guys donated tonight are gonna go to the students in need in our local community, um, Southwood County. So here in Rapids, Nakusa, Port Edwards, public, private, it doesn't matter. As long as you are in need, we can help you. Um, we do have a registration process for students that are in need. Um, so if you're aware of any families in your community, neighbors, friends, relatives that could use some help with school supplies, um, our registration will open on May 1st. You can do it online, or you can call me at 211 and we can get you registered too. Um, so the supplies that you donated, like I said, go to the Stuff the Bus, and then the Stuff the Desk is our distribution event. So we're having that um, two separate days this time, uh, August 16th and August 17th. We're trying something new. Um, so there is when the students come through, we have everything pre-packed for them. They get to pick out a backpack, put their supplies in it, and out the door. It's really streamlined and really quick and easy. So um, we're also looking for volunteers for those events. So if you're interested in volunteering, um, our big one that we're looking for help with is doing, not the pre-packing, we have that kind of down with the student council at Lincoln, they're an amazing bunch of kids that come in and help us. Um, but we're looking for help those two days that we're doing distribution. So it's Friday afternoon, August 16th from 3 to 6. And then on Saturday, the 17th, um, I believe it's 8.30 to 11.30 by the time we clean up and get everything packed up. Um, so we are definitely looking for some volunteers. And what you would do is just help us walk the um, recipients through to get their supplies, kind of guide them along, give them a helping hand if they need it. Um, we could help do some help at registration. So there's lots of different places that we could use some great volunteers for those um, events. So just once again, thank you so much for all those wonderful school supplies. And um, if you feel the need to donate more, you can always drop them off at the United Way office anytime. Um, we, can, we take monetary donations and um, school supplies. So thank you very much. Thank you, Amy, for telling us about that important program that helps so many kids in our schools. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Andrea Wagner. And you may, if you've been here before, you've probably met Andrea before. She is a dietitian, a registered dietitian at the hospital. And she's going to tell you a little bit about the appetizer choices we made for this evening. Good evening, everybody. 
So, uh, often with aspiring women, I can't stand behind that, it's, it's too short, or I'm too short. So, um, <laughs> often with aspiring women, our food ties into the theme of the evening. However, tonight, it does not tie into the theme of the evening. We just have some tasty good food tonight. But I still want to talk to you about it, let you know what you're eating, what you're getting, and things like that. So, one of the menu items tonight is the uh, crab five cups. And as you can imagine, crab is a good source of protein. It also happens to be a good source of vitamin C, B vitamins, and iron. It's low in saturated fat. Unfortunately, though, crab is high in cholesterol. So if cholesterol is on your radar, you have high cholesterol, family history of high cholesterol, um, you just don't want to go overboard with the crab. The little mini tarts that they are tonight, um, a couple of those, no big deal. Again, just don't want to go overboard. Uh, we also have the honey garlic chicken skewers, and again, as you can imagine, chicken is a good source of protein. It's also, like the crab, a good source of B vitamins, good source of iron. It's low in saturated fat, and unlike the crab, it's low in cholesterol. Um, both of those, have, I mentioned, are a good source of B vitamins, and I want to talk about that for a minute. Um, often in a typical American diet, we don't get enough B vitamins, and unfortunately as we age, our bodies become less efficient at absorbing the B vitamins in our diet. So it's good to have um, a dietary source of B vitamins on a regular basis, daily, ideally. Uh, B vitamins are, can help with your mood, they can help with um, anxiety and depression, and there's actually studies that show that if you have adequate amounts of B vitamins, you can help prevent dementia. And I'm sure everybody would like to prevent dementia. <laughs> um, also, let's see, on the menu tonight we have the fruit, uh, fruit pizza. And that is our dessert for the night. And I love that fruit is part of our dessert. Um, often when we think of dessert, we have cookies, cakes, brownies, ice cream, whatever. Um, but when you're adding fruit to your dessert, even if it's on top of a scoop of ice cream or something like that, you're adding so many more nutrients to your diet. So anytime we can add nutrients to our diet, that is a benefit, that is a plus. Not only is it adding nutrients to the vitamins and the minerals, but uh, fruit is a good source of fiber. So fiber helps us feel full, it helps us feel satisfied. So when you're having fruit, when you're having fruit on your dessert, um, you're often eating a smaller portion of dessert than you would if you didn't have that fruit on it. So I hope that gives you some information. Maybe you learned something new tonight. I hope you enjoy the food and the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Um, and next, we have a special treat for you tonight. Our aspiring a cappella is back. We're back in the house. Thank you, Tammy. And while the ladies are coming up here, I want to apologize ahead. We are going to sing and run. Um, between the four of us, three of us right now are dealing with a close family member with a health issue. So we've been up at the hospital and nursing homes. And so pardon our absence, but we have other places to get to to be by our loved ones. Um, the, the song we're going to sing to you tonight is to the tune of Bye Bye Love. How many have heard that song? Yes, many of you. Um, and the reason I wanted to introduce the song is because I have to again say that this woman to my right, your, your left of me, Cindy Orzel, our director, again came up with some amazing lyrics just for your program tonight. Um, so how many of you have never heard Aspiring Acapella? A handful. Good. You're in for a treat. And I want to personally thank Cindy for the lyrics. And we're going to all hover around this one mic and enjoy to the tune of Bye Bye Love, I've got pain. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. I've got pain. I've got dizziness. My body's such a mess. I feel I'm gonna cry. Help me, please, to fix my aching knees. My doctors all agree that I need therapy. -y. I need therapy. -y. I have bursitis in my left knee. It is so painful to walk for me. appointment will set me free. <laughs> Therapy, you have to exercise so we 
you can optimize the gains they can provide. Therapy will help me today and send me on my way to feeling mighty fine, feeling mighty fine. I hurt my shoulder while on the job. Most days it's painful, feels sore and throbs. Guess I tore my rotator cuff. To move my arm can be pretty rough. Therapy will get you back on track. Now nothing's out of whack. I feel like I could fly. Therapy, make sure you do it right. You'll feel out of sight and kiss the pain goodbye. Bye bye, pain, bye bye. Bye bye, pain. Bye bye. And now I'm going to introduce uh, our keynote presenters, and actually they're going to introduce themselves because we have several for you tonight. They are the therapy professionals from Aspirus River Therapies, and, uh, and they each have uh, a different specialty, and they will tell you more about each of those. So, I'm not sure who's first. Okay. So, Anna Ligny is our first speaker, and she will tell you a little bit more about herself and get the show started. That's going to be a hard act to follow. Um, I think they could easily do a commercial and pretty much tell you what we do every day. So, that was excellent. Um, our main goal tonight was to tell you about some of our specialty programs. Um, as we were discussing how we were going to do this tonight, we realized that maybe people don't even really generally know what we do. Um, but I think the ladies that just sang probably explained a lot of what we do, to be completely honest. Um, we treat pain uh, is our primary thing, as many of us do. Um, as physical and occupational therapists, we treat um, just about any joint in the body for orthopedic conditions, neurological conditions, it might be something painful, any time that you've lost function of any activity of, of your life, that's what we, we would address. Um, Tim, our speech therapist, would address uh, speech problems, so those might include um, speech articulation, our language and cognition, um, and also address swallowing. Um, so that's kind of generally what we do, and we'll talk a little bit about each of our specialty programs tonight as well. Um, if you don't know where we're located, we'll tell you a little bit about that. Our primary clinic uh, is here in Rapids. We're in the Bethke building, and that's located at 1041 Hill Street, kind of uh, diagonally across the street from the hospital. Then we have two satellite clinics, uh, one in Nakusa at the Nakusa Medical Center, and we also have a satellite clinic in the town of Rome at the Lakes Clinic. So um, we can find therapy close to home for, for most of the people in the room, I think. Um, so that's a little bit about what, what we do in general. And we'll start talking a little bit about some of our specialty programs that, that are available. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about headaches. Who in the room has ever had a headache? <laughs> I think all of us can probably say that we've had a headache, and that's just exactly how common headaches are. I think each of us have, have known how frustrating it can be to have a headache, and when headaches become persistent, how much that can really affect your whole life. Um, and probably what people don't know is that we treat headaches a lot. 
um, and what the source of those headaches is. Um, and one thing that you might not know is that they're probably coming from your neck. Um, the neck is a really sensitive structure, so it can um, not only give you neck pain, and I think we've all woke up with a pain in our neck before. Um, <laughs> neck, you can have pain in your neck. If it's aggravated enough, it might give you a headache. It might give you pain around your shoulder blade, and it can refer pain all the way down your arm. So the neck can be responsible for any of those symptoms or some of them, or kind of spotty symptoms. Um, the other symptoms that you might come across, you know, headache, jaw pain, ringing in your ear, um, kind of mid-back pain, um, sinus pressure, all those can be headaches that really are originating from the neck. Um, and, and I think we see almost more headaches now than we have in the past many times relating to kind of our technology and we're all pretty device driven and those those forward head postures are oftentimes what is driving uh, that, that neck to be painful um, so any of those symptoms any area in the head can be included in the headache that's what that picture is showing is that we know that the that the cervical spine can refer headaches into any piece of your head um, so Headaches are pretty specific um, and can be pretty debilitating. Um, so what would we do for a headache? Um, first of all, we would do an evaluation to find out kind of what your headache detail is, what your headache history is. Um, we would not only treat headaches that might be acute or new onset of headaches, sometimes we treat people that have had headaches for many years and, and get an idea of what type of headache you're having, how often it comes on, and what your headache history has been. So our treatment strategies would probably include an exercise program, and that exercise program would be designed to relieve that headache. Um, we'd also look at corrective postures. Um, bad posture over a prolonged period of time is usually what's driving the pain. So we have to kind of figure out what, what's driving your situation and, and correct those postures. Um, and get into education on body mechanics um, and what is driving your particular headache along with sleep positions. Sleep, and if, we, if you've ever woke up with a pain in your neck, you probably had a faulty sleep position. And that's just how sensitive the neck is. Um, so it's pretty detailed and that, that's kind of a highlight of what our headache uh, treatment program would be. Um, next, uh, we're going to have Amanda come up and talk about low vision. This is kind of tall. <laughs> Good evening. I am Amanda Whipple. I'm an occupational therapist with Aspirus Riverview Therapies. I have my board specialty certification in low vision through the American Occupational Therapy Association, and I'm currently the only one certified in the state of Wisconsin. I've been working with low vision clients since about 2013. Low vision is defined as a visual impairment that does not improve with corrective lenses, that interferes with a person's ability to perform their daily activities. Low vision is very common, and the number of people that are anticipated to be living with a visual impairment is only supposed to grow as the years fly by. The purpose of low vision rehab is really to address the person's specific visual impairment by either helping improve aspects of their vision when possible or um, helping them modify their activities or their environments to help them stay independent. Some common causes of low vision include age-related uh, macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, cataracts, glaucoma, brain injury, including concussions, and also a stroke. I have a background in neuro rehab, which is the treatment of people who have had injuries to their brain, whether by traumatic brain injury or stroke. Not everybody who has a stroke is going to end up with a visual impairment. But they're finding it's much more common than they originally thought. 
2017 study suggested approximately 65% of people who have had a stroke have some sort of a visual impairment post-stroke. Traumatic brain injuries, including concussions, can be caused by an external force to the head. Examples of this would be a motor vehicle accident, um, a fall, or contact sports. Now, does anybody know what the leading cause of a traumatic brain injury is in the United States? Contact sports, I heard. Contact sports actually only accounts for about 21% of traumatic brain injuries. It's actually a fall, which can happen to anybody. You guys saw how much ice we had and snow we had this winter. It's not that hard to fall, but the, the implications of a fall can be, can be pretty significant. <clears throat> Following a traumatic brain injury, there's often a disruption between um, the communication between the eyes and the brain. And studies show that 90%, 90% of traumatic brain injury patients suffer from visual dysfunctions. Now this could be blurred vision, this could be sensitivity to light, this could be reduction in the loss or the loss of your visual field. It could be headaches with visual tasks, um, difficulty reading, or difficulty with different eye movements as well. And visual function is it's often overlooked when diagnosing brain injuries, but if left untreated, it can have serious consequences. If a person has suffered a stroke or an injury to a part of the brain that um, involves vision, what I do after a, an initial evaluation, taking a look at each person's specific visual impairments, is I form a treatment plan for them. And if it has to do with a stroke or a brain injury, usually that involves performing specific exercises that are tailored to their own visual impairments. And those exercises are aimed to help the brain and the eyes communicate better, to allow for improved vision. Treatment strategies, again, are, are based on each person's individual visual impairment, and there's such a spectrum of visual impairments out there, but that's what the purpose of the evaluation is, is to perform different assessments to weed out, essentially, what we need to work on in therapy. Treatment can involve um, visual skills training, performing scotoma training, which is basically finding the area within your vision that you're able to see, um, providing recommendations for environmental modifications and teaching ways to use your senses or adaptive equipment and technology. There is so much technology out there and it's an exciting phase. I know it doesn't contribute much to the headache area, but um, there is quite a bit out there that allows people with a visual impairment to maintain their independence. So that's, that, we're in an exciting time as far as that goes. And I, I got to talking and I forgot to click the thing. But, <laughs> sorry about that. But this just um, recaps you know, what we can do in um, low vision rehab. Visual skills training, as I had mentioned, increasing visibility um, for my clients with macular degeneration, increasing contrast, which is um, you know, essentially black on white or yellow on black, um, adding fluorescent colors to something with a dark background. Um, and also increasing lighting and appropriate lighting too because there is such thing as good lighting and bad lighting. Um, sensory substitution strategies, so sometimes when your vision is extremely poor you can use um, like the technology, Amazon Alexa for example, um, things that you can do talk to text instead of actually having to see it. Um, also putting little knobs on the oven too so that you can use more tactile sensation with that. Organizational strategies um, that involves, you know, putting things where you, it's easy to find, right? So you don't have to dig through all those cupboards and cabinets to find that one can opener that works the best. Um, that's, that's something that I go through with um, everybody as well. Um, environmental adaptations, you know, again, lighting, increasing contrast, making things safer at home and making things so that you can maintain that independence. 
and then community mobility strategies. How can I get around if I can't drive, for example? Um, those are all things that I cover with Low Vision Rehab. There are some good resources for equipment. Um, the Aging and Disability Resource Center of Central Wisconsin is a great resource to start with. They do have um, services for people with low vision. And the address and phone number is in your, your packet there. Also, Mid-State Independent Living Choices. It's based out of Stevens Point, but they have a wide variety of equipment specific to people with low vision. And the, the benefit of that um, place is that they allow you to essentially try it, see if you like it. Um, a lot of times it's for a little or no cost for a period of time, and then they will help you obtain that equipment if that is something that you want to have. Also, um, retail chains, local rehab supply stores, online retailers, they have a, a lot of different pieces of equipment um, for low vision, so great places to, to look if you are wanting to maintain that independence despite the low vision as well. And without further ado, here's Elizabeth. Thank you. So I'm Elizabeth Ironside, and I'm going to talk about dizziness, vertigo, and imbalance. Um, and I see a few familiar faces in the room that maybe have dealt with some of these things before. Um, and Amanda led in really nicely talking about falls. Because, so dizziness is the most common reason that people over the age of 75 seek out a physician appointment. 30% uh, of people over the age of 60 complain of dizziness or vestibular problems, and almost 50% of people over 85 have problems with um, dizziness or vestibular issues. And dizziness is a big predictor of falling, and falling is in people over the age of 65 is the number one cause of accidental deaths. So, hopefully I have your attention now. Uh, so dizziness can be caused by a number of different reasons, and some of those physical therapy can address. Um, so dizziness can be caused by heart problems, brain problems, psychiatric problems, peripheral vestibular disorders, and multisensory disorders. Uh, lots of big words there. But physical therapists treat the peripheral vestibular disorders primarily, but we also treat neurologic disorders, multisensory disorders, and brainstem disorders when it's deemed appropriate by the rest of by your physician team. So peripheral vestibular disorders um, are the most common, and they are treated with great success. Uh, the picture up there is of the vestibular and the hearing system. The hearing system is the little snail-like thing, and the vestibular system is the rest of it. And that vestibular system is located in your inner ear, and it communicates with your brain and your body. So the vestibular system orients our head in space. It detects motion and then signals to the eyes, the head, and the body to move to help us maintain our balance and also our vision. So the vision and the vestibular system work very closely together. If the, if the vestibular system is not sending correct information out, it causes some of these symptoms that I have up here on this slide. Um, vertigo is a sensation of spinning or motion or that your eyes are moving. Um, unsteadiness or imbalance. Oscillopsia, which is like a blurred vision, and when it's with your vestibular system, it's usually when you're in movement, so that you can't focus your eyes when you are walking or riding in a car. Um, also, I put lightheadedness up there. It's a really general term, but it is often a descriptor for um, dizziness that can go with a vestibular problem or a cardiovascular problem. Uh, so there are different causes to vestibular dizziness, and I'm going to talk about the two most common. The most common is positional vertigo. Um, and this is usually people who report that they get dizziness with bending over, rolling over in bed, uh, looking up or reaching up to get something. Uh, and then they can describe it as that spinning sensation often that lasts for a minute or two. However, many people don't describe that spinning sensation, um, especially as people get older. 
they are less likely just to describe it as spinning vertigo. So I think it's important that if you are having dizziness, even if it doesn't fit in all of these categories, that you see somebody who um, knows something about dizziness because they can maybe help figure out what's going on. Uh, and the most important thing here is that it is extremely treatable. Um, one study showed that 74% of people were basically had their dizziness resolved after one treatment, and another study showed 94% were resolved within three treatments. So it's worth a shot. Um, and I won't even make you do exercises like the acapella group told you you were going to have to do <laughs> most of the time. Um, the second kind of dizziness I wanted to talk about is dizziness that damages the nerve that goes to your vestibular system. Um, and that dizziness is a little different. It often does start with kind of a severe spinning dizziness. Uh, and then as it, it gets better in a few days and often, but there is a persistent um, imbalance that goes with it. And sometimes that eye where you feel like you can't focus on things when you're moving um, goes with that. That is also very treatable. Uh, and we treat that usually with some exercises. So I would encourage you to also, if that's your problem, seek out physical therapy for that. Lastly, I want to mention the importance of addressing balance. Um, dizziness can cause balance problems, and frequently does, but there are also many other causes of balance problems. Uh, but balance is modifiable. Uh, oftentimes with a few exercises, you know, five to 10 minutes uh, a day or a couple times a week, you can improve your balance, so if you notice that your balance is not what it was or you're having challenges with doing some of the things you were able to do, again, I encourage you to seek out a referral to physical therapy or um, start with one of the community balance programs. All right, and I'm going to pass it off to Phyllis. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Phyllis Lehman. I'm a physical therapist. Um, at Riverview and now Aspires Riverview for the past 28 and a half years. And I've been focusing on the treatment of women's pelvic health for the past, well, probably it's been more than 20 years now. So it's been around, treatment has been around for a long time. So um, I just want to address a few of the things. This is just a, a huge array of different uh, diagnoses that I may see people for, but I want to address a few of the most common ones. And first on the list up there is urinary and fecal incontinence. And incontinence um, affects 25 million adult Americans. And there's just a massive financial impact of about $19.5 billion a year spent on, on evaluation and, and treatment of incontinence. The different types of incontinence, if you are having any problems with leakage, um, is stress incontinence. That is when we leak urine with physical exertion. So um, exercising or lifting or bending, um, those types of things. And urge incontinence is where we leak urine when um, we, it's associated with a really strong urge to go as well. And then mixed incontinence is a combination of stress and urge incontinence. And then also fecal incontinence, which is the loss, the involuntary loss of stool or feces. So all of those things are very commonly treated in therapy, um, and I'll address that a little bit more as we go. So the second one talks about pelvic pain, and chronic pelvic pain is something that affects millions of people as well, and it can have a huge impact on daily function. At least 50% of people who've been um, diagnosed with chronic pelvic pain limit their daily activity as many as one to three days a month, and that limitation can mean I don't go to work those days because I can't get out of bed or I can't sit or I can't stand for prolonged periods of time and so I call in sick to work, um, things like that. Um, and there's also a high rate of depression that's associated with it, so I think they kind of will feed into each other a little bit that way. Uh, conditions, some of the conditions that can cause pelvic pain, um, can, it can stem from low back pain, abdominal and or pelvic floor trigger points, depression, constipation, um, irritable bowel syndrome, interstitial cystitis, and endometriosis. And so in the clinic, um, I not only look at the diagnosis and try to treat that, we treat the symptoms, but we also look at functional impairments. And that's one of the things I know Ann mentioned is a big thing that we do as therapists is we look at function and how is it what you're presenting with, how is it affecting our, our daily lives. 
Um, so some of the things that we address in the clinic or that I do with my pain patients is um, if there's limited tolerance to prolonged positions like sitting or standing, um, difficulty sleeping, difficulty driving, sitting for prolonged periods at, at your desk if you're, if you're working um, at, a, at a seated job, um, pain limiting your sexual function, and then bowel and or bladder dysfunction. So, and then talking about dysfunction of pelvic muscles, it can be associated with incoordination of the muscle, weakness, tightness, lengthened muscles, or pain. And it can be caused by a huge number of things. It can be caused by um, SI joint pain or low back pain, pregnancy and postpartum issues, or um, someone who has a really difficult delivery and has some type of injury during childbirth, sexual abuse or trauma, a fall where you fall onto your tailbone or you fall onto your hips can, can all lead into a, a pelvic pain and, and um, dysfunction of the pelvic floor muscles. Chronic holding of your urine, somebody who works all day and doesn't go to the bathroom the entire day can really feed into some problems with the muscles. And also chronic straining for urination or having bowel movements. So um, I just want to mention too that because this is a woman's thing, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm talking about the most, but I also treat many, many of my patients that I treat are men, so it is a, a male um, issue as well. So um, most, of my, most of my men are prostate cancer patients or someone with um, a, like a hypertrophy or an enlarged <coughs> prostate that's affecting their ability to go to the bathroom. So um, anyway, the, um, the definition of pelvic rehabilitation is that it's a non-surgical approach to rehab of dysfunctions in the pelvis that contribute to bowel, bladder, sexual health, and pain, uh, sexual health and pain complaints. So my program focuses on the evaluation of the pelvic muscles, including manual assessment and also EMG assessment of the muscle. And then my treatment program is based on my evaluation findings. So um, everybody is treated a little bit differently depending on how they present. But what I really focus on a lot is retraining the muscles using biofeedback. I do manual treatment, lifestyle modification, so just making changes that are going to help improve your situation. Um, education and then eventual functional retraining so that we can get you back to doing those things that you want to do or that you need to be able to do. So I do try to keep things a little bit light and a little sense of humor so my uh, little comment up there is with age comes skills it's called multitasking I can laugh cough sneeze and pee all at the same time so all right. in the lymphatic system that can cause things like leg swelling, um, arm swelling, and in the neck and head sometimes as well. Um, so the lymphatic system is responsible for helping um, bring the fluids from the limbs back away from the limbs to, to prevent that swelling. So if there's something wrong with that, then you get swelling in those areas. Um, but sometimes, so how do you get lymphedema, right? We can be born with it, or you can acquire it. Um, and that is usually acquired by trauma to the lymphatic system, usually surgery or lymph nodes removal. Um, and so that's when you would come in for treatment. I also see people, a lot of people who have swelling in the legs who don't necessarily have lymphedema, but um, depending on what your diagnosis is, we can typically treat that as well. So what does it look like, um, therapy-wise? So first off, we would start off with a lymphatic massage, which would help um, bring the fluid away from the limbs. And then uh, we would wrap your limb up or the affected area with um, foam and a bandage that looks like ace wrap, but is not ace wrap. And our ultimate goal is to get into a compression garment to help keep the swelling from coming back. Um, so that is that's diff, uh, typically what lymphedema treatment looks like. So on a completely different note, I'm going to switch here to dry needling. Um, dry needling is something that we also offer in the physical therapy. 
And it is, uh, we use a thin needle basically and insert it into your muscle or basically um, a trigger point. Trigger points are knots in the muscle, sometimes you can feel it and it, you know, if you press on a muscle and it really hurts and you feel like a big knot, that's, that's what we're looking after. That can cause pain and referred pain. Um, and so you take a needle, you put it into the trigger point and you work that um, knot out to, to get pain relief. Now, a lot of questions that I usually get is, is dry needling the same thing as acupuncture? And no, it is not. Acupuncture uh, has more of an Eastern approach, um, so the theory behind what we're doing and what we're going after is different. Uh, dry needling is more of a Western approach, so we are really looking to target that trigger with that muscle. Um, and usually with, uh, trigger, with dry needling, we can treat things like headaches, uh, knee pain, back pain, as long as it has something to do with a muscle that's kind of uh, affecting, uh, causing your pain, we can treat that with dry needling. But with my patients who I use dry needling with, I typically tell them that dry needling help, helps with uh, decreasing the pain symptoms. It does not address why or how the trigger, trigger pain got there in the first place. So this is where we, I do ask you to do stretches and exercises to help keep those trigger pains from coming back. All right, so next we have Tim. My name is Tim Oldar. I'm a speech language pathologist at Every Review Therapies. What I'm going to talk to you today about is just some of the things that we offer in the speech therapy on it and then some specific programs that I do offer too. First of all, what does speech, language, and swallowing therapy involve? It involves several things we've listed up here under speech. We work with people that have voice disorders, whether it be from a neurological disorder, from polyps on the vocal folds, or whatever, hoarseness in the voice, they still have people with hoarseness to correct that. Um, articulation, if you have problems pronouncing your words, or um, fluency, stuttering, those are things we see in speech therapy. Language therapy, that involves um, basically communicating and getting your point across in the language. As I'm here expressing myself now, able to talk, so often people cannot express themselves, they can't think of the words, and they know what they want to say, but they can't get it out, so people help them and improve that. Um, it involves receptive language, which is the auditory ability to understand what's being said and the ability to read and comprehend. Some people have, that have, been, have difficulties after a stroke or something that the stroke affected just their ability to read. They pick up something and they can no longer read. And so we help them improve that reading ability. I had a lady one time that loved to read and after about two, three weeks of therapy, she was actually starting to be able to read again. Before that, she was so devastated because she couldn't read and she came in one time later and said, boy, I can start reading now again. So it really helped her improve that ability. Um, expressing themselves verbal and written language, again, I mentioned the ability to verbally express yourself with words, ability to communicate what you want to say. So often the person cannot do that when they have a speech disorder. Um, so we work on teaching them how to find words, and then we also work with written expression, the ability to write things. Because so often, nowadays, people won't write like they used to write, but people that we still write, we still use it, and you have to be able to write your name for so many things that people don't realize so often we use writing. Um, under language, the augmentative and nonverbal communication is another area that we look at, and that involves the um, ability when people can no longer verbally express themselves, saying, okay, they have such a severe aphasia, which means language disorder that's ex with expression, that they need to find some other way to communicate. So then we teach them, and I actually work with companies, and help people get devices that can be a speech generating device. So get a device that they can use that will actually produce the voice for them. I had a patient recently that happened to, she was ALS, and she lost her voice completely. And she couldn't do anything but whisper. And it was very frustrating because she, her husband could never understand her. Her daughter, five-year-old, was very frustrated. And we got her a device that basically she had all of her language skills. She typed into things, and she started typing, and it sped out the voice for her, and it just made a huge difference in her life. She said, I felt like I got my communication back. She felt like she hadn't lost so much ability. She got, so that was something we work on. Cognition is another area that we work on, and that has to do with your thinking skills. We talked um, about memory, ability to attend a task, organize, plan, reason, um, numerical skills. Sometimes people just, I've seen people come in with just 
deficits with all that they lost was the ability to put numbers again together. Somebody comes in that was an accountant, they no longer can do any more numbers. We work on that, or you work on a checkbook or something like that. So those are the main areas in speech and language. And the last area we look at is swallowing. And that's an area we have several specific programs, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, with swallowing, what we're looking at is if a person's having trouble, and they're choking, they're coughing, they just can't get the food down like they used to, they can definitely do some therapy for it to improve that. So often people come in and they say, oh, I've been having trouble for years and never did anything about it. And they've adapted, but yet they're still choking or they're having problems or they might get pneumonia because things are going in the lungs. So we work with them to minimize things like coughing, choking, food sticking, that type of thing. Um, what I want to mention next is basically several specific programs we have in the speech department. The, and we'll start with the two in the middle there, the video swallow studies and then the vital stem therapy. Video, video swallow studies, what that basically is, is when a person comes in for swallowing therapy, they start off and I watch and see how they eat, help them adapt their diets, maybe put them on a thicker liquid because sometimes it's easier to swallow, um, or change their to a softer food, or even pureed food, which means baking like a baby food. Some people just actually do better with that. And over my career in 25 years, I've actually seen two people that have said when we switched to the puree that they, they were so much better for them and they were so happy to eat that. Most people don't like it and will say, no, I don't want to eat puree. But a lot of people will do it short term because you can improve things. You work on the muscles, improve it, and you can back to a regular diet. Um, so the video swallow studies after is something we do with an x-ray as a second step. And it's an instrumental exam where you actually go into the radiology department or imaging department at the hospital and they x-ray the swallow and they watch it real time and say, what's happening with the swallow? Where's the food going? Is it going in the lungs or down the trachea or is it going down the esophagus where it's supposed to? And then you can teach them, um, the patient different strategies, different things to help with that. So that's the second one. And so often the doctors um, do order the video swallow studies. There's something we specifically do at a review. And then the vital stem therapy, which I have the device right here, is another um, program for swallowing that's only been around about 2001. And I was certified in 2007. And what it is, is up there is a picture of it. But what it is, is this little device here. And as a little, all it is here is this, um, gives electrodes to the swallow. And you take that, put out the electrodes, these wires, and you attach them attach them to the throat here, and it basically is able to then give stimulation to the swallow that you can't do otherwise. Used to be just traditional swallowing therapy. When you think about it, these muscles are deep in your throat. There's not much you can do like in other exercises by just moving them, because you can't just move the throat muscles very well. This gives it another way of doing it. Many people that have had swallowing problems for years have done this, and then that's improved their swallow, and so they've been able to get back eating again. And it's happened to people that can't eat at all, wound up with a tube feeding, couldn't eat, you do the therapy like this vital stem and then they can eat again and they've been very happy. Um, then we have traditional speech language therapy which is basically just working with people with problems after strokes or whatever to, to get the language and swallowing back on the voice, things like that. Um, again, overall with speech and language what you're looking for is the main thing and I, what I really like about it is that you're helping the person get back something they lost, the communication ability. And you, you would, wouldn't realize how often I see people come in and say to, them, to me, boy, I just can't get the words out. I'm frustrated because I can't communicate. And hopefully through doing therapy, they can improve those skills to get that communication and get the language back. Or they're swallowing and eating again because they'll come in to me and they'll say, I can eat, but I, I don't like to eat out anymore because I get so embarrassed because I'll go out to eat and I'll start choking. <laughs> so I don't eat out anymore. So then they wind up just eating by themselves with nobody. And so they lose that whole social aspect of it too. <coughs> so we help with that. Um, and the last program I want to mention is the first one up there, the Lee Silverman Voice Therapy. That's a specific program that was, I was trained in that um, specifically it was designed for Parkinson's patients, but it works for most any neurological disorder. It's a voice program that basically is intense, a four-week program, 16 sessions designed for a person to use a loud voice, and that's where that LSVT louds is up there before. And they basically train them how to get that voice back. And you'd be amazed again how many people come in with a voice that they're whispering, people can't understand them. They go through this training, 
and they get their voice back, and they can talk on the phone again, they can do a lot of things that they couldn't do before. So that is the uh, last program kind of with speech and language. And with that, I will pass the mic off to Casey, and she'll talk about other things for Parkinson's patients. Hello, everyone. My name is Casey Fancher. Thank you. I'm an occupational therapist. Um, also, I wanted to mention Elizabeth Ironside, who presented earlier, also works with um, people who have Parkinson's disease. So in case I forget to mention her name, I wanted to start out with that. Um, so what can therapy do for people with Parkinson's? It can help them with things like handwriting, getting in and out of bed, putting on their jacket, um, getting on and off the floor, in and out of a car, uh, walking around the grocery store, so many other things. And it goes back to those functional tasks that uh, people do on an everyday basis that they lose because of the symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, so that's just a small list of what therapy can help. Um, so how therapy helps these things is through exercise. So that last bullet point there. Um, research studies have shown uh, a huge benefit for <coughs> exercise in people with Parkinson's disease. Um, it helps them improve those symptoms. So those are symptoms of those slow, small movements, um, rigidity, coordination, balance, their body awareness, and fatigue. Um, and then again, all of those symptoms impact their functional abilities, which then maybe you need them to need more assistance for things. So. Therapy focuses on regaining their independence. Um, another thing with exercise um, is that exercise has been shown to be just as effective as medicine for treating Parkinson's. Um, so it's important to start <coughs> early. So if you know anyone who um, just got diagnosed, maybe aren't having all of the symptoms yet, um, it's super important to get started in all of the exercises to slow the progression of the symptoms. So at um, the Beth Key building is where the, uh, Elizabeth and I um, work with people for the Parkinson's programs. We um, are both trained in a different program. The top one is the LSVT big program and then uh, the bottom program is the Parkinson's wellness recovery. I don't want to sit and talk about all the differences between the programs because in general they have all of the same ideas behind um, what we're doing with the patients and all of it is based on teaching them exercises. So again, combating all of those Parkinson's symptoms, um, making their movements bigger. So we teach them a certain set of exercises. Um, they're easily adaptable as well. So um, I talked about how Starting exercise is super important early on. Um, it can also benefit those who maybe are more affected by Parkinson's and are maybe stuck in a wheelchair. Um, we, can, can we can do these programs and do exercises that are tailored to what they're able to do. Um, so no matter where they are at in their progression, um, therapy can help. So um, the overall goal is to slow the, degree, the disease progression, improve the symptoms, restore function, and increase the longevity and quality of life. Okay. Hello, my name is Kathy Bowman. I'm an occupational therapist. Um, Save the best for last, right? <laughs> I'm here to talk to you um, not so much about a treatment that we offer, but some evaluations that we can do to help get answers to questions that you, your loved ones, your doctor may have about your ability to continue to drive, um, or maybe your readiness to get back to driving if for some reason you've stopped, whether it's for you know, an illness, a stroke, um, just a long hospitalization, whatever has stopped you from driving. So obviously, for many people, the ability to drive is kind of essential to who we are. You know, if you drive, imagine that being taken away from you and how much that impacts your independence. Um, but the vast majority of people actually outlive their driving age. So you have to think at some point in your life, you may not be able to drive anymore. Um, 
And when I say that, age doesn't necessarily mean you can't drive. Um, there's plenty of people well in their 90s that are driving. Um, and there's plenty of people in their 40s and 50s that probably shouldn't be driving. <laughs> um, so driving really has everything to do with your overall um, visual health, cognitive health, and physical health. Making sure that you have all those skills to safely operate a vehicle. Um, so there's really not one test to do that says you're a safe driver or you're not a safe driver. Um, I'm sure everyone knows someone out there who's probably not a safe driver, but um, don't necessarily need to have this test done. Um, it's more of a kind of a thorough assessment of how your vision is, um, how your cognition, your memory, your judgment, your kind of speed of response, um, and your motor function, how your range of motion is. Um, do you have enough strength in your leg to press the gas pedal? Um, do you have sensation in your foot that you can feel where that is? Um, so, like I said, there's a lot of good drivers, there's a lot of really bad drivers on the road at, at any given time. It's not like we have to do this test on every single person. Um, a lot of times it's more of a test for the doctor. Um, you know, you go in and you have two minutes with the doctor. They can't really assess everything and determine if you're going to be a good driver, if you're going to be able to get back to driving if you've stopped. Um, so they can send uh, a referral over to our clinic so I can do a thorough assessment. Um, I check basically those four things that are out there, your vision. Um, the DMV says you need to have 20-40 vision acuity in order to drive. So I check your acuity. I check your peripheral vision, your contrast sensitivity, your depth perception, do all those visual checks. Um, check your reaction time. We have a, a, a machine that actually check tests how quick you can go from the gas to the brake, um, making sure that you have adequate speed in order to do that. Um, just doing the overall range of motion and strength testing. Can you turn your head to look? Do you have enough strength in your, or turn your head to look? Um, do you have enough strength in your, in your foot to um, step on the gas pedal? And then probably most importantly, checking cognition, um, which is how your brain is thinking. And can you make all those quick decisions when you're driving um, to keep yourself and everybody else safe on the road. Um, so this really just helps clients, families, and doctors determine if and when someone is safe to return to driving after an injury, illness, or hospitalization. Um, a lot of times I'll get referrals for somebody who's recently been diagnosed with dementia. Um, get, getting that diagnosis of dementia doesn't necessarily mean you have to stop driving right now. But having this test can at least give a good baseline of where you're at um, and kind of give you some strategies to help you stay safe um, and give you some options for what to do maybe when you get to that point where you're not going to be safe driving anymore. Um, I do the clinical aspect of driving assessments. If we feel like we need a little bit more information, I can refer you to one of the local driving schools here in town that actually gets you behind the wheel and gets you driving. Um, I've seen many people who have stopped driving after a stroke. They've gone through a lot of therapy, they've gotten better, and they feel like they can go driving again. Um, but maybe it's been six months or a year since they drove. So we'll get those people in the car with the driving instructor and just make sure that they feel comfortable again so we can give that information to the doctor and they can give them the okay to drive. Um, I do have a lot of brochures um, in the back. One of them is called the We Need to Talk. It's family conversations with older drivers. Um, I also have one that's called At the Crossroads. It's having conversations about Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and driving. Um, and then I brought this one. It's a widow's guide to buying, selling, and maintaining a car. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with driving, but you don't want to get swindled by those car salesmen. <laughs> So I, I think I'm just going to open it up to questions. Um, I think we'll take some general questions now, but if there's any specific um, thing that we talked about that you might have a more individual question, we'll all be available afterwards. Um, so is there anyone with any questions? Can um, sciatica be helped with dry needling? <laughs> So, sciatica is basically symptoms of um, the sciatic side nerve being pinched. So, um, depending on where it's coming from, yes. Sometimes the muscle around the sciatic nerve gets really tight so that the sciatic nerve gets um, suffocated. And if we can loosen that muscle up a little bit, then it'll give that nerve room to breathe and relieve some of the symptoms. 
um, mouth is coming from the back, uh, we can treat some of the back muscles as well, but um, it all depends on where it's coming from. So yes, it can be, and it also depends, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Yes. 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 This assessing your driving skills. Yes. Do you have a simulator? Oh. I haven't gotten to the question yet. <laughs> no, no, no. Assessing your driving skills. I was just told recently that you have a simulator that you can put people in. It's, I wouldn't say it's so much a simulator. Um, it's actually made by Xbox, so it's more of a uh, video game kind of thing. Um, but it has a screen that kind of simulates a driving situation, um, and it has a gas pedal and a brake. Um, so that's how I can test your reaction time. Um, it'll be on a screen, and it'll look like you're driving, and something will come into the road, and you have to step on the, on the brake. So. If a person doesn't do well at that, do you pull their driver's license at that point? I, I do not. Um, I don't have the... Oh, she, I'm sorry. She, she just asked if, if someone doesn't do well on my test, if I can pull their driver's license. And I will tell you that's everybody's fear when they come in to have this assessment, is that I'm going to take away their driver's license. Um, I, I legally cannot do that. Um, I make all the recommendations to the doctor. So, um, like I said, that's, there's not just one test. So I will send the doctor the results of all the tests that we've gone through, and the doctor will help determine um, if they should drive or not. There's, there's been some situations where I, I see people, and it's pretty clear cut that you probably are not safe to be on the road. Um, and so then we have that conversation with the doctor right away. Yes? Is it possible with that lymphedema that uh, you eventually would not have that problem anymore? That's a question for now. She's asking if when you have lymphedema, basically, if you can get rid of it. So right now there is no cure for lymphedema. Um, they are in the process trials right now for doing um, lymph node transplants, um, but that's still kind of in the trial phase. Um, with lymphedema, we can really just manage it. So with the um, lymphatic massage, the um, compression garments, the, the end goal basically is to get you into a compression garment to keep your lymph from re-swelling. Um, so that's our goal at this point. I think an important piece of that is that pizza goes way too long. And I think a lot of these things that were presented today, people wait, and then it's kind of too far, it you know, takes a lot longer to come back because you've waited a long time to have the press. Don't hesitate to either call and ask about these programs or try to physician or nurse practitioner. Any other questions? Did you hear that? Going back to the eyes, visionary migraines. How is there any help for any of those? I know they do not know what causes them. With vision migraines, um, I don't. So she asked if there's anything to be done about vision migraines. Um, migraines in particular, I don't do a whole lot with, but. There can be pain associated with overstimulation. Um, oftentimes after a brain injury, things like driving in a car and uh, looking out the window as a passenger, that can really overstimulate you. And one of the defense mechanisms of your brain to get you to stop doing that activity is to cause pain, right? Because then you're, you're going to stop. You're going to close your eyes and you're, you're going to stop. So um, part of what I do is increase the strength and coordination and endurance of your eyes to prevent um, headaches associated with... See, I have no headaches. I just have to learn my letters. Um, another way to get eyes is for front. With the blurred vision you're talking about? So blurred vision can be caused by a lot of different things, um, and that's why it's so important to maintain a relationship with your optometrist or ophthalmologist as well um, to see what that cause is. Because blurred vision is a very, um, like I said, it can be caused by quite a few different things from a brain injury to um, cataracts to glaucoma. So um, having that, that uh, further assessment from the ophthalmologist is, is really critical.
I'll make a comment on the visionary migraine as well. Um, again, you're right that we don't know enough about a visionary migraine. You know, yours is not pain associated, but obviously you have a change in vision. Sometimes that can be coming from the neck. Not always, but it can. I've certainly treated pe people with a vision component um, of their headache. Um, they usually have pain along with it, but not always. Um, and have made a change on their vision. I had one guy that was a trap shooter and he used to be extremely accurate, went through some uh, headache treatment with him. He was also having pain along with it um, and, we, and improved his vision as well. So I can't say for sure that it's part of the neck, but it's, it's possible. Um, so headaches are very, very complex. Uh, so it takes a lot of, of uh, investigation. Obviously, you've probably had a tremendous amount of medical investigation first, and I would encourage you to continue on with that, but there can be a net component along with it as well. Yes. I was diagnosed with what they call uh, migraine aura. Mm -hmm. And when it first started, I just thought it was floaters in my eye. But it always would start at the upper left hand corner and come across my vision like this. And I just pull over to the side of the road if I was driving and wait till it passed. But um, it hasn't gotten any worse from the time that I was diagnosed up until now. I wish I could look at my crystal ball and tell you. <laughs> what if I could? Again, sometimes uh, we can make a change on migraines. Again, most of them usually have a pain complaint along with that visual aura. If it's visual aura only, it's possible that there is some connect neck component to it, but it, we could never be sure. Um, the good part of what we do is, particularly with the headache program, is that it's, it's very non-invasive. So I, I wouldn't make it any worse. <laughs> well, it's just aggravating. Very aggravating, yes. It doesn't yes. happen very often, I would say. And it doesn't seem to be getting any more frequent. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was wondering, would it get more frequent? I don't know. I just have to, I just have to wait and find yep. out, I guess. I have a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you help people with tinnitus or ringing in the ears? I know there's a lot of conditions that we didn't get to tonight, and it's just incredible to me what our team at the rehab center um, can help people with, things that they don't think there's any solution for. I just have to learn to live with it. And that was one that I wondered if you ever deal with. Um, that's a common complaint of many of our headache patients. Um, again, usually there's a headache component that goes along with it, um, but people are always surprised to find out that ringing in the ears is also one of those symptoms that we ask about because it can be neck related. Have I seen it change? Many times. Sometimes not, um, but I've seen it change many, many times. Um, so ringing in the ears can be a component of a neck-related headache problem, definitely. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I have a 